Trade Union Congress, labor unions give state governors end of January deadline for new minimum wage. Niger Immigration Service to begin investigation into border bribery allegations against officers. In international news, U.S., Canadian and European leaders agree Iran may have accidentally shot down Ukrainian jets. And in sport, Nigeria declare interest in hosting 2020 Africa Cup of Nations. This is ANN News. I am Ola Kibuki on Latin G. Labor unions are threatening to go on strike if state governors have not agreed on the implementation of a new minimum wage by the end of the month. Union leaders get the ultimatum in a communicate issued at the end of their National Executive Council meeting in Lagos on Thursday. 15 states are yet to agree on consequential adjustments of salaries, while Lagos, Kaduna, Balti, Katsina, and Bronu states have agreed to pay the new minimum wage. Other states started negotiations just a few days to the end of last year. The state former police commissioner Fatai Oshini says the new Southwest security outfit Amoteku will be allowed to carry game guns just like the hunters and would have powers to arrest. Oshini special advisor on security to a your state governor. Oshini also said Amoteku would not run a detention facility but would purely be an intelligence gathering group to the convention and security forces. The governor's aide said the Amoteku idea originated from a paper presented by the United Kingdom's Department for International Development. He said the paper was adopted by the Nigerian police force, so it is harmful to the security structure. Rather, it is not harmful to the security structure of the country. Oshini said the North Central States had also operated a similar outfit known as the G8 in the past. The Nigerian Immigration Service has promised to begin full investigation into bribery allegations against its personnel at the borders. Nigerians have frequently alleged on social media that immigration officials have indirectly legalized le illegal migration at patrol checks point on various Nigerian highways with their cash for past levels of as low as 200 bribe, 200 naira bribe per checkpoint. NRS Public Relations Officer Sunday James says the Controller General of Immigration, Mohammed Babandide, has promised the alleged talk would be investigated. Online learning has become a very important feature in today's education environment and it is very popular and Nigerians are not lagging behind in its application. Some young Nigerians have now come up with an innovative e-learning app developed to tell African children's stories in their native languages. The Porta de Jibadmos has the details. When Dominic Onyekechi's sister asked him to read a story to his niece, little did he know that simple request would drive him to create what is today an innovative educational app. So you can read this one now. Dominic searched his sister's mini library at home and none of the story books he found there caught his fancy. None of the books reflected African societies and none has black characters, which is what Dominic wanted. So I took one day, I went to the market and there were tons of stories in the markets, but very, very few African stories. So after like four hours of scoring bookshops in Balogun, I think, and I could only get one story that was African. It was even African animals, not even people, for instance. So I felt that was problematic. So I decided to write a story for her. So when I wrote the first story and got my friend, my other co-founder, to illustrate it, she liked it. Her friends liked it too. I wrote another one. And I decided that it's a problem that I didn't need to solve only for my niece. It's a problem that a lot of girls, a lot of boys all over Africa and Nigeria had too. So I decided to develop a lot of these stories and put it on an app make it available in multiple indigenous languages so that people everywhere and anywhere can access the stories. That app is now known as Akidi and has about 30 books with around 2,000 subscribers since its soft launch in September 2019. And despite just being in its testing phase, 
Akiti is already the biggest e-library of books in indigenous languages in Nigeria. The narrative in the story can go a long way in shaping the mind of children. The shows that children watch now, the books they read now about white people, about white things, can show them the possibilities that can happen, but it can also give them an excuse not to aspire to those possibilities. So I think we need to buy into the ownership of values and ownership of culture, and that is exactly what Akidi does. It's an ownership that everybody, or a story that everybody in Nigeria can buy into. With three languages translated, we're able to reach 80% of Nigeria's population. With a subscription fee of as low as $3, young children can have access to the books available on the app. Their effort is also helping to preserve local languages and make books accessible to people in their local languages in a country where the English language has almost swallowed local dialects. Like even though you have children all the way in America, wherever they are, they have access to this application, they have easy access to these stories. So they get to learn about their traditions, they get to learn about their language. There are a lot of African languages to digitize. We can digitize Swahili, that's over 600 million people in East Africa speak, Zulu and Kosa, and all these other African languages. So I think digitizing African languages and making sure that Africans in diaspora can be able to like be literate in African languages is a very big impact um, sub point for Akidi. Despite their modest success, they say funding still remains a big challenge. They've literally bootstrapped up to this point, but they're not allowing that slow them down. Akidi is set to launch formally in this quarter. Currently, three schools are already pre-signed up on the app. The projection is to have around 50,000 subscribers by the end of 2020. Coming up, African news. South Africa faces credit downgrade fueled by ESCOM troubles. And later, international news. World leaders point to radar images that show Ukrainian jetliner may have been brought down by surface-to-air missile. To African stories, South African economy is facing another threat of a credit downgrade. Economists um, agree that South Africa's economic growth this year will be in the doldrums, hampered by intensified power cuts and the frozen pace of structural reforms. Uh, credit rating agencies, the government, and global financial institutions expect economic growth uh, to be lower than 1.5%. Angela Coppola has the details. The consensus is that the currency will take a knock in what is described as a foregone conclusion by some analysts and economists. There is a contrarian view, however. There's going to be an immediate tumble in the Iran, but that tumble will be very short-lived in our assessment because we think that the markets right across the world, or the players in the market, have actually factored in that. We have already been uh, near junk level. That's a speculative area. So people already had taken into account the fact that South Africa would pay, perhaps collapse into junk status. While many analysts believe that the downgrade is a done deal, some believe the country still has space to maneuver and avoid that negative decision. In fact, the best time for South Africa to do that will be during the budget speech. For as long as the Minister of Finance can indicate quite confidently as to the measures that can quickly uplift this economy, we should be in a position to be given yet another few months to continue pumping ourselves. But certainly the government has an opportunity, but that opportunity is going to be lost in my view. South Africa has managed to avoid that final ratings agency downgrade since President Ramaphosa came into power in 2018. But has the country used up all its goodwill? I think still there is an opportunity for us to, 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 to walk out of that. And for as long as the president in his speech, for example, that's coming in the next two days or three, talks about it, and then the finance minister emphasizes on that, we should be able to swing the minds of so many of these decision makers who are likely to press, if you want, the button of a downgrade. There have also been projections that bond markets will also suffer if a downgrade happens. Others suggest that the opposite is likely to happen because of the global bond market yields. If you look at the global economy right now, the negative yields in Europe, indeed in some countries in Asia, yield hunters are so hungry for, for, for good yields. South Africa sits as one of those economies that have got good yields and they will definitely not pump money immediately out of the country. In fact, some will act big coming in. 
It's crunch time for the South African government and the South African economy, but it seems that it can be resolved and we can be given that space to actually grow the economy. China and Egypt have agreed to boost bilateral ties through enhancing cooperation in all fields. Chinese and Egyptian foreign ministers announced a set of consensus that were achieved after holding a strategic dialogue in Cairo earlier in the week. Reporter Yazoo Hakim has the details. Before his departure, Mr. Wang Yi met with his Egyptian counterpart, Sameh Shukri. Strengthening ties and cooperation topped the agenda of talks between the two officials. We stressed on the intention of China and Egypt in promoting their ties and raising them to a higher level. China has suggested to raise the relationship from the current strategic partnership to what is known as a common destiny, and we are working on this. There are multiple conflicts in the region, such as Yemen, Syria and Libya. But China and Egypt see eye to eye on how to deal with these crises to avoid an escalation. Our stance is that the political solution is the only solution for Libya and other countries. Foreign and military intervention and the use of force will always lead to escalation of violence and complicating matters. We have established a joint committee that Minister Shukri and myself will head. It will plan and coordinate all forms of cooperation and policies between the two countries. The top officials also discussed economic cooperation and the Belt and Road Initiative. The two sides agreed on a quicker pace in finalizing the Belt and Road. We will work on a synergy between the Belt and Road and Egypt's Vision 2030. We will plan and expand the cooperation in this regard, including the Suez Canal Industrial Zone, the new capital, the railway sector, as well as the renewable energy projects and space. We agreed on strengthening efforts in supporting Egypt's development goals and economic reforms. Many Chinese companies will be investing in projects that develop the infrastructure, in addition to China's financial support in the form of loans and grants. Mr. Wang Yi had earlier met Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Sisi. Mr. Sisi expressed his deep respect to Chinese President Xi Jinping. He also said he looks forward to further boost the strategic partnership between both countries. The meetings with Egypt's top officials bring to end Mr. Wang Yi's visit to the North African country. The interest to produce bed nets locally in Rwanda was prompted by a controversy in 2015 in which two and a half million substandard mosquito nets were imported into the country, triggering a surge in malaria cases. Now thousands of nets have been produced daily in the country. Rwanda medical authorities say this development has led to a decrease in malaria-related cases in the country. Here is a report from Rwanda Broadcasting Agency. Citizens across the country have lamented over the fact that their mosquito nets are old and need to be replaced so as to prevent malaria from spreading. As you can see this stone all round, we are bitten by mosquitoes. It is torn and I had to patch it up. We are doing everything to protect ourselves, but we sleep fighting mosquitoes. In order to contain malaria and prevent it from spreading, a mosquito net company was started four months ago in Kigali Special Economic Zone. The director of LTC Ameranda Limited, Gagan Zaramba, explains that every day the company produces about 16,000 nets. Up to this point, we have trained our staff in each one of them, produces up to 100 mosquito nets every day. In a day, we produce 16,200 nets, and we are aiming to do more in the coming months. We have spent over 1.1 billion Rwandan francs. Division Manager of Malaria and Other Parasitic Diseases at RBC, Dr. Emma Brembitu Emremnyi, says that in the last two years, the government of Rwanda spent a lot of money acquiring units. We decided to buy from outside, especially through our donors and from our own here in Rwanda, so that we get enough from our markets. We will need about 7 million nets. 3.5 million of these will be bought from Rwanda. We are still fighting malaria and we won't back down. The government of Rwanda imports 7 million mosquito nets at a cost of 15 to 17 million US dollars, an equivalent of 17 billion francs. 
about 3.9 million citizens got treated for malaria in 2019. This month, 7 million mosquito nets will be distributed to citizens, and 3.6 million of these were made in Rwanda. Coming up, international news. World leaders point to radar images that show Ukrainian jetliner may have been brought down by surface-to-air missile. And later, sport. Nigeria declare interest in hosting 2020 Africa Cup of Nations. Welcome back. This is ANN News on the foreign scene. U.S. President Donald Trump and some European leaders and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau are expressing suspicion that Iran may have accidentally shut down the Ukrainian airliner that crashed on Wednesday. Trump said somebody could have made a mistake and fired a missile that brought down the plane. He rejected Iran's assertion that a Boeing 737-800 plane developed a catastrophic mechanical fault at an altitude of 2,400 meters. Government sources say U.S. officials have examined satellite data and imagery that suggest the airliner was accidentally targeted and hit by a Russian-made surface-to-air missile just after taking off from Tehran. The head of Iran's civil aviation organization denies the plane could have been hit by a missile. The United States House of Representatives has approved a resolution on Thursday that would require President Donald Trump to get congressional approval before using the military to engage in hostilities. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi had earlier criticized the Trump administration for not consulting Congress before conducting last week's airstrike, accused Iranian Kuts Force Commander Kashim Soleimani. The resolution calls for the president to halt the use of U.S. forces against Iran's unless Congress has declared war or given statutory approval, or unless such military action is necessary to defend against an imminent attack against the United States, its territories, or armed forces. White House spokeswoman Hogan Gidley called Thursday's resolution misguided and ridiculous. She said it would hinder the president's authority to protect America and its interests in the region. Although Australian bushfires are still burning in certain states, some of the areas are safe enough for evacuees to return. So did some in New South Wales and they are not thrilled by the devastation they met. Jack Borton reports. The Rand family have been building up this organic farm in the Australian state of New South Wales for the past 30 years. Decades of work devastated by bushfire. Those trees down there must be about 20 metres high. There's only just grass around them, but they're scorched all the way to the top. Doug and his son Jess water a few lemon trees they hope will survive. The property is uh, blasted by fire intensely. The leaves are gone off the trees. Uh, the grass is gone. The, there's just dirt uh, covered with soot. Uh, where there used to be pasture. Their entire garlic crop, almost ready for sale, was wiped out. While the fire spread too fast to move the animals. That's the most distressing thing I think for most farmers uh, is the loss of livestock. Uh, we had just a small group of 140 sheep. Uh, we lost half of them. Uh, we had to shoot a few ourselves. Um, the veterinary services euthanized another 30. Um, they were very kind and got us to stay up the, up the house and we counted the gunshots as they finished them off. Our neighbor had 50 odd cows, he's got three left. That was sent to us. That's coming down this mountain where we're standing on now. Belinda Rand shows her family a photograph of the fire that a friend has sent her. The Rands evacuated, then walked back in after the fire because the roads were blocked by trees and dead animals. And as we were coming down the road, there were branches and trees falling behind us. They were just behind us and trees and branches falling in front of us. There was no wildlife. It's normally a bird paradise. There were carcasses strewn around and really it looked like an atomic bomb had gone off. 
The saving grace was that despite all the odds, their house was saved. We were bracing ourselves for finding a heap of smouldering ruins by the time we got down through the, through the driveway. This, this is what it looks like, the Gilmore Valley, what it looks like in a good year. The Rand family say they will rebound, a task that will be much harder for the wider community. There must be hundreds of millions of trees uh, in forestry areas that have gone. Uh, you can't grow them in a year or two. Uh, so the forest industry, which is a major employer in this area, uh, is, will be set back in, incredibly. So it'll be years for some industries, decades for others. And the fires are not over yet. After only a brief respite, the temperature and wind are fast rising again, leading to predictions of what officials are already calling a mega blaze as early as this weekend. Up next, sport. Nigeria declare interest in hosting 2020 Africa Cup of Nations. Please stay with us. Welcome back. This is ANN News and Sport. The Nigerian national men's handball team lost to Olympic Suleiman of Tunisia on Wednesday in a preparatory friendly match ahead of the Africa Cup of Nations. Despite the latest setback, the Federation's technical director, Ferdinand Demiane, has expressed optimism that the team will improve. Nigeria's Football Federation have confirmed their interest in hosting the 2020 Africa Cup of Nations alongside Equatorial Guinea. The Super Falklands have won the tournament as host on three previous occasions in 1998, 2002 and 2016. Nigeria is also the current holders, having claimed an 11th title overall in 2018. That is in news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and all the breaking stories, visit our website, nnafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Africa TV. I am Ola Jumbo Kyo Latiji. Enjoy your weekend.